Any general questions, problems, anything? Um, a couple of reminders, although I did send like a thousand emails yesterday. So, of course, sometimes a thousand emails is worse than uh, than zero since things get lost. So, um, in terms of reminders of things due, the Sprint One synthesis slash presentation technically due tonight, although the Dropbox is open into tomorrow. Um, it always causes some confusion, but really every assignment has two dates on it. Um, there's the time it's actually due, but to avoid problems with, you know, people trying to submit at 1201 instead of 1159, um, I leave the drop boxes open usually 24 hours longer, just so people who are slightly late still can submit since I don't really charge late points anyway. So um, that's, again, more sig figs and more math with sig figs. Um, and a bunch of people have already submitted that. So kudos to you for being ahead of the curve. Um, there is the first OWL homework, the first real homework, which is technically due Tuesday. Um, with all homework, I do recommend looking at it earlier like I would be looking at the second OWL homework this weekend also, um, because it does give you things to look for in class and it gives you some idea of what you might already know and what you might need to know. Um, and of course, due tomorrow at midnight is the week three modality choice. So expect more spam emails over the weekend. I'm reminding you of these things, but any questions on any of that? The other thing worth mentioning in one of my many emails, the Cengage rep said um, that Chrome did an update, which caught them off guard. Um, and so there are some things they're still trying to patch. So if there's something that doesn't seem to be working using Chrome, Firefox is working better at this point. Um, so just an FYI, if you're having issues. Usually Chrome is the preferred browser, but at the moment, not. So any other issues? Dead silence, which is always interpreted by me as a standing ovation, so thank you very much. Um, actual chemicals, maybe, sort of today, although mostly really on Monday. Um, this is in some sense the most descriptive class of the entire year. Um, and so not a lot of math, right, but a lot of definitions just so we know what the terminology means. Technically speaking, right, chemistry is the study of matter. Of course, matter is a word you could use in your everyday parlance, right? It has a very specific meaning, however, in chemistry. Matter is defined as anything that has mass and takes up space. So as I like to say, it really anything you could touch, hold, taste, smell um, is matter. That's why even though there are really no chemistry majors in here, there's a few chem engineers and that's sort of the same, but most people in here are from different science disciplines, but because almost any science with the possible exception of math, right, deals with objects, right, which are now specifically matter, right? Chemistry becomes at least a supporting discipline for most other science and engineering disciplines, okay? And matter itself is broken down into other subcategories. All right. 
And some of that is based on the divisibility of matter, meaning I can break it down into smaller and smaller pieces. When I do that, one of two things will happen. All right. If I start with, for example, a tree, trees are made of wood. If you'd like a more chemical term, trees are made of cellulose. All right. I can chop down the tree and cut it into boards. I can take the boards and grind them into sawdust. All right. And what I have is a smaller and smaller version of the tree. Well, without the leaves, right? And so I still have wood and it's still cellulose. And as I get smaller and smaller and smaller, right, I have a divisible substance that remains wood until it gets very, very small, right? At some point, if I try to subdivide it further, it will lose its woodiness, okay? And that is really the distinction between molecules and atoms, okay? A molecule is the smallest piece of matter that maintains the identity of that matter, right? And so, as I like to say with sugar, right, you can take a bowl of sugar and split it into smaller and smaller grains, and you can grind up the grains and make smaller and smaller grains. A molecule of sugar is the smallest piece of sugar that still would be sweet. Right. You can divide things further, right? But if my division results in a loss of properties, right, I have now broken my molecule into atoms. And from a chemical standpoint, atoms are viewed as the building blocks of matter. For you, you know, who have a physics bent, and there are physics majors in the room, right? Obviously, you know that you can divide atoms into smaller things, right? Like quarks and protons and neutrons and electrons, even before you get to quarks. And so it's not that atoms are indivisible, but they're not viewed as being chemically divisible, right? If you wanna shatter an atom to get subatomic particles, it is a really high energy physics process and no longer considered to be a chemical process. And so as a result, technically speaking, atoms are the smallest piece of matter that are chemical, right? And all molecules are made up of atoms, right? And so for the molecules, Right, a lot of it is defined in terms of, at the moment, physical properties. At some point, we'll start to talk about chemical properties, but today I'm mostly talking about physical properties. Right, and so even beyond having molecules and atoms, I can also take different molecules and mix them together. So, you know, if I have sugar, it's sweet, and it's a white granular substance. I could also mix it with water, right? And of course, water is wet. <laughs> it's a really carefully defined physical property, right? Water is wet, it's a liquid, right? It's not sweet, it flows, right? And so my mixture of sugar and water has some properties in common with the sugar and some properties in common with the water. And in some cases, properties that might not actually fit with either one, right? So sugar is a solid, it's a dry solid. Sugar water is a liquid. Sugar is sweet, sugar water also sweet. If you heat up sugar, it melts. If you heat up sugar water, it boils, right? And so they have different physical properties by virtue of being a mixture, even though some of the molecules are the same. And so mixtures become a separate classification for matter, right? Wood is 100% cellulose. There's only one molecule type in your wood. Sugar is 100% sugar molecules. There's only one type of molecule in your sugar. But frankly, 
many, if not most things you encounter in your everyday life are mixtures. There's some water there and there's some sugar there and there's some delicious flavor crystals and we call it Kool-Aid, right? And the mixture has properties that can be similar to the underlying substituents, but in some cases can be completely different. And at various times this semester and even to sp into spring, we talk about those physical properties, even though they're non-chemical, because let's face it, if I'm going to do something chemical, it means manipulating my molecules. I got to put them in a beaker. It's going to matter whether they're solid, liquid, or gas as to how I'm going to contain them into that beaker, how I'm going to measure them, right? And so we never quite completely get away from these physical properties. And so matter can be divided into essentially four big groups. I hate two of these groups. I'm a mixturist, apparently, right? On the right-hand side, I've got my mixtures. I don't so much hate the mixtures, I hate the fact that they're classified as two different types, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Okay, but if I take matter, which again is something that has mass and takes up space, I can classify it into one of these four groups, right? And it's really based on a pair, two pair of questions, really, right? First and foremost, can you physically separate it? Right, meaning I can physically remove one component from another. So for example, if I go back to my sugar water, I can boil away the water and be left with the sugar. It is separable into two different components. And so it's a mixture, All right? If I just have water, right, there's no way to separate it and get anything but just a smaller subset of water. Right? If it's not separable, it's termed a pure substance. And then as we've already discussed, it is either a molecule or an atom. The difference being now chemical separation instead of physical separation. Because it becomes chemical when I start talking about making or breaking bonds. And so if I don't do anything chemical, and I strictly physically separate them, right? I've got molecules. If I then try to physically or chemically separate them and am successful, there are atoms underlying them. If I cannot chemically separate it further, it was an atom all along, right? On the mixture side of things, Again, there's two different types of molecules or more, which makes it a mixture. The distinction that's, that I hate, right, is this idea of it being heterogeneous or homogeneous. And that is a question of uniformity in the mixture. This is sometimes obvious, right? It is sometimes far less obvious. And I tend to think of the distinction really being less significant on a global sense in more a question of the scale at which I look. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Ultimately, this is easy to see if you've got your you know, molecular bionic vision, right? Because in terms of the molecules, which again, we tend to never see, right? The big challenge in chemistry is everything's invisible, right? It is clearer in the molecular picture, what's what? So if I look over here on the left at my helium, right, there I have, right, nothing but single little balls, all of one type, right? Those are what atoms look like, right? If I combine my atoms, Right. I can make molecules, so my water picture shows me a whole bunch of H2O molecules, but notice everything in that picture is an identical H2O molecule, which is why coming down my left-hand side here, 
it's a pure substance because everything's identical, but it's a molecule because it has more than one atom joined together to form it. All right. And then in my mixture side, looking at either one of those two pictures, I now have different types of molecules. So in both of those cases, there's water, right? So you can see the H2Os, the two little white balls with the red ball in both pictures is water, but there's also something else present. In the case of the sand, I've got my silicon dioxide molecules that are laying on the bottom there because if you've ever been on the beach, the sand is on the bottom. Um, whereas my tea with sugar has my sugar molecules, which is mostly what you're seeing in that picture, floating around amidst the water molecules. That is the kind of picture where they want to make the distinction that it is heterogeneous or homogeneous in the sense that there are layers of different ratios of the molecules, right? If I'm in the wet sand, at the bottom I see mostly sand with maybe a few stray water molecules. If I'm up at the top, I see almost exclusively water molecules with no sand, right? Whereas in the T picture, supposedly, right? I see a uniform ratio of sugar and water and tea, right? No matter where I am in the glass of tea. The reason I hate this distinction is it's somewhat a question of scale, right? Because if I get small enough, right, I can make my window just see sugar and not see water or I can make my window show me two water molecules and a sugar molecule. And so on a very microscopic scale, even the tea with sugar starts to look heterogeneous, right? And so to my mind, right, the most difficult distinction to make is between the heterogeneous and the homogeneous mixture, right? Sugar water has sugar and water, it's in the name, it should be, unless it's really, really concentrated and becomes syrup, right? It should be homogeneous, right? The top of the Kool-Aid is just as sweet as the bottom of the Kool-Aid, assuming you stir it properly, right? Any point in the solution should be equally sweet because there's no separation, right? Mayonnaise, or if you prefer Miracle Whip, colleague and I had a big discussion over which was better. I said I wasn't really a fan of either. He's a huge fan of both and he called me, well, names. So mayonnaise, again, it's a mixture. It's got oil in it and then it's got egg in it. All right. And egg itself is a mixture. There's the yolky parts and the white parts. All right. But mayonnaise is creamy white throughout. It looks exactly the same throughout. It should be just as greasy at the top as it is at the bottom. And so it's a homogeneous mixture, right? Those we wouldn't argue so much about until you got to the molecular scale, right? Something like relish, pickles and water and sugar, oh my, right? Because you could easily see the difference between the pickles and the corn and whatever else is in the relish, right? It is a heterogeneous mixture because on a macroscopic scale, it's a mixture. And so, right, I can always classify into one of these four groups. The challenge on the left-hand side is the distinction between being an atom and a molecule is really only obvious in either the molecular picture, which I rarely see. I mean, if we were in lab now and I handed you two substances, it would be really hard to tell whether it was an atom or a molecule because, excuse me, yeah, an atom or a molecule because you can't see 
the microscopic picture, right? The only way then to tell would be to try to do something chemical to it and see if you could split it, right? One of the things you can almost always do with a lot of substances is burn them. So this is what, you know, when chemistry becomes fun, let's go to lab and just burn everything, right? If we burn the wrong thing, we'll be blowing it up. It'll be fun. There'll be fire, there'll be explosions. You'll all want to be chemistry majors by the end of the day. Right. But it's really hard to tell just by looking at it. All right. On the right hand side, to some extent, it becomes a question of scale. Right. And so it can be tricky when you've got something that's sort of mixed. Right. And it's maybe not as distinctly chunky as my relish. Right. And so right this is like the problems on the homework that i hate and i want to argue with all of them and you will want to argue with all of them and argue with me and so i expect my email to be flooded at some point right glass of coke pure substance element should be an element no pure substance element homogeneous mixture heterogeneous mixture we could play this game but no one talks to me first question is does it have ice or not <laughs> right because my Coke with ice, heterogeneous. I got ice in there, which is distinctly separate phase from the Coke. Even without the ice, what about the bubbles? All right. So flat, iceless Coke, probably a homogeneous mixture. Whereas if it has any fizz whatsoever, probably heterogeneous, which is why I say it becomes something of a challenge depending on scale, right? Chocolate pudding. Well, it depends on whether my chocolate pudding looks like that or my chocolate pudding looks like that, right? And so, you know, I'm justifying my hatred for heterogeneous versus homogeneous. Hamburger, I don't know. How finely ground is it and how obvious is the fat relative to the meat, right? Probably could argue it's heterogeneous. On the other hand, right, there should be equal parts fat to meat throughout the sample if it's finely ground and so, I think that distinction can be hard to make, right? The only time it's obvious, right, is if you have something like apple juice, where unless you really went to a microscopic scale, there's no distinctly different pieces to it. All right. Yes, no, maybe, sir. Yes. The question was, if you have O2, is it a molecule, right? Um, because it's an element. And so, yes, things like the diatomics, which I'll say it now for the first time. I say this a lot and then people always look at me funny. Halogens, hun. No need to go to the Title IX office. I'm not calling you honey. The halogens plus hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen are the seven diatomic elements just an easy way for me to remember them, right? Their elemental form is diatomic, but they are two atoms and therefore molecules, right? So element is sort of a separate distinction from either atom or molecule, right? But even a solution at some point, a cloudy solution, right? Heterogeneous, right? But how cloudy does it have to be? That middle one, is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? It looks uniformly cloudy to me, right? As opposed to the one on the left, which looks darker at the bottom than the top. And so I continue to try to justify my hatred of heterogeneous versus homogeneous, right? In the end, my physical properties will depend 
on whether I'm a pure substance or a mixture, right? And my chemical properties will depend on whether I'm an atom or a molecule. And so we bounce back and forth between this chemical and physical picture a lot. Right? When we wanna do chemistry, which ultimately is the goal here, right? It's really the chemical properties I'm mostly concerned about, but my need to measure and manipulate the molecules to do the chemistry requires that I understand the physical properties as well. So we will do a little bit of both. Right. A word about energy. If you wanted a Nobel Prize, and really who doesn't, you know, besides the fancy prize and the fact that, you know, everybody thinks you're smart, it does come with money. Right. But if you want a Nobel Prize, find a way to define energy. It really is one of the most fundamental things that still does not have a really obvious, all-encompassing definition, right? As a result, we mostly have a tendency to talk about energy in terms of what it does rather than what it is, right? And so energy is often defined as the capacity to do work. So there's usually something going on Right, some movement. If I push a chair across the floor, it is really hard to actually define all the energy components that go into that because my body is doing chemistry and there's chemical energy involved and there's physical energy involved and there's friction energy involved. All right. And there's even really tiny pieces of energy like relativistic energy that are not so important to that picture but actually do occur. All right. On the other hand, if I just focus on the fact that the chair went across the room, it's much easier to define. It's a chair moving across the room, right? The big macroscopic movement picture usually encompasses two types of energy in a physical sense as opposed to a chemical sense, and that's the old kinetic energy versus potential energy issue. The big rule, rule number one for energy is conservation of energy. Right. That is usually phrased in some version of the top line. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It simply changes form. Right. The bottom line is the total amount of energy I have at the beginning of any process is always exactly the same as the total amount of energy I have at the end. I might burn sugar and get heat, right? But the total amount of bond energy contained in the sugar and the total amount of heat and bond energy contained in the products has to be the same, right? So any discussion of actual energy, and we will bounce to energy several times during the course of the semester, right? Starts with principle number one, right? That energy is always, always conserved, All right? And so, you know, the classic sort of physics picture is, you know, throw something off a building, right? If the idea of burning things and blowing them up doesn't want to make you be a chemistry major, the idea of throwing watermelons off the top of this building should make you want to be a physics major, right? In that case, this is my trade-off between potential energy and kinetic energy, and this specifically gravitational potential energy. My motorcycle at the top of the building, don't ask me how I got it up there. Right, it's not moving, it's not doing anything, it's just sitting there. But by virtue of its altitude in a gravitational field, it has potential energy. If it goes over the edge, the potential energy decreases in exactly the same magnitude as the kinetic energy increases. Right. And then when it hits the ground, there is deformation energy that results in heat. 
And so the energy throughout the entire process is always the same. It's just changing form as I do it. We don't throw a lot of things off of buildings, right? And so for us, it's usually less about gravitational potential energy, but it's more about chemical potential energy. My molecules have energy stored in their bonds. If I make or break bonds, that energy can be released or absorbed. And so I have a trade-off. In that case now, between chemical potential energy, the kinetic energy of the molecules cause molecules move. And there may well be a heat component to it as well, which is reflected in the kinetic energy of the molecules, right? It is very hard to directly measure many energy types, right? And so a lot of times we rely on an indirect measurement, temperature as a means of probing the kinetic energy of the molecules, right? Generally speaking, temperature is a relative measure of energy. Right, hotter means more, colder means less. Right, we'll talk about this more when we talk about gases, but temperature is defined as the median kinetic energy of a system of molecules. Because of course, not every molecule in a system has identical energies. There's a distribution. Some molecules are relatively hotter than other molecules which are relatively colder. This is why water evaporates, right? There is some water molecules in your glass that have enough energy to be a gas. Right. The median kinetic energy is what we refer to as temperature. And temperature scales are really all determined somewhat arbitrarily. Right, if you want your own temperature scale, and who doesn't? Right, if you can't get a unit named after you, get a temperature scale named after you. It's all about getting something named after you. Right, so for example, if you arbitrarily set the boiling point of water at 100 degrees, and you arbitrarily set the freezing point of water at zero degrees, you have the Celsius scale. So don't do that, it's already got a name. But there's really no reason why boiling point of water is 100 and why the freezing point is zero. That is just a water bias. Because what I really need are two points of reference that I can always check, right? And so a physical change like boiling or freezing, right, allows me to calibrate, right? If I got water in France and I got water in Argentina and I have water in India, I can always boil it and find my 100 and I can always freeze it and find my zero. But there's no significance to those numbers it was arbitrarily set up as a scale, works just fine. Take your boiling point of water, call it 100. Take your freezing point, call it zero. Put 100 lines in between. Well, technically 99, right? And you have a Celsius temperature scale, right? If you don't like water, pick alcohol. You could do the exact same thing with alcohol. Take the boiling point of alcohol, make it 1,000 degrees. Take the freezing point of alcohol, make it zero degrees. You now have a temperature scale, right? A temperature scale, which is very, very relative because you pick two arbitrarily points and use them to define the temperature scale. There is no significance to the numbers. It was simply an editorial choice by you, right? Take the boiling point of water, call it a thousand. You know, take the melting point of sodium chloride, call it 10,000, you have a temperature scale. Right. 
And for most purposes, that's good enough, right? Because it allows me to see whether I am relatively more energetic or relatively less energetic, right? The three most common temperature scales, as you probably know, are Fahrenheit, at least in the US, because we refuse to go metric, Celsius for most of the rest of the world because they went metric, and then Kelvins which is one of several scientific temperature scales referred to as absolute temperature scales. Right. And for most things, Fahrenheit, fine. Right, because again, if I care about relatively hot or relatively cold, that's all I need to know. So it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it is hot out there. It is 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it is cold out there. Right. That's all I need to know. And frankly, if it goes from 90 to 100 in my beaker, I know there was energy released because it got hotter. And so in terms of changes and relative energy, doesn't matter. Use any temperature scale you want. The only reason Kelvin's is special is because if you truly, truly want a temperature scale, that gives you not just relative energy, but an absolute amount of energy, you need to get the zero in the right place. Right? And the only thing Kelvin has going for it that Fahrenheit or Celsius does not, and it ha is it has the zero in a right place. I almost don't wanna say there's a absolute zero for all forms of energy. But in terms of kinetic energy of the molecules, which is what I'm using my temperature for, the thing about Kelvin's is that it's zero corresponds to zero molecular motion, right? So in terms of the kinetic energy of the molecules, Kelvin's has the zero in the right place. Celsius does not, right? At zero Celsius, water freezes. Yay, that's great for water. A lot of other things are still liquid. And even the water molecules are still moving. But take my water to zero Kelvins, nothing is moving. There are other forms of energy still there, like chemical energy. But in terms of molecular energy, which is what I'm trying to have my temperature measure, right? The Kelvin zero is the zero energy point, which is why scientifically speaking, right? Kelvin's is my preferred temperature scale whenever I am quantitatively discussing energy, right? And I'm not always. Right, if I want to boil water, I don't necessarily care exactly how many joules of energy it takes to do it. I put it on the stove and I boil the water. In which case, Celsius or Fahrenheit works as well as Kelvin's. If on the other hand, I want to know exactly how much energy is in my boiling water, I need to be in Kelvin's. I should specify how much molecular energy is in my boiling water, right? And so if I'm trying to be quantitative about the energy, I wanna be in Kelvins. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. This is one of those things that makes, you know, science geeks chuckle in the winter. It'll happen this winter, you know, if you're still in Rochester, we could pivot at any time, <laughs> right? Some weathermen, because Rochester has these days where we have like three, sometimes four seasons in a day. You know, we literally had a day, was it three years ago? It was 68 in the morning and it was 25 at night. So, you know, it started as a nice spring day and, you know, went through fall and ended up in winter. Right. And some smart ass, excuse me, smart Alec, whoops, smart Alec weathermen will say, the temperature is half what it was this morning. And I want to say, who cares? Right? Because 20 to 10 is half. 
On the other hand, 20 degrees Celsius is like 70 degrees and 10 degrees is like 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But in Kelvins, 20 degrees Celsius is 293 and 10 is 283. There's hardly any difference in Kelvins, which really represents the absolute amount of energy, right? So if you're in Kelvins, my relative temperature is also the relative energy. If I go from 200 Kelvins to 100 Kelvins, I have half the amount of molecular energy exactly. Whereas if I go from 20 Celsius to 10, who cares? If I go from 20 Fahrenheit to 10, who cares? It's colder. I might need to put a coat on. But it doesn't tell me anything quantitatively about the amount of energy. All right. Boiling point of applesauce is 212 degrees. No, it is not. Is it? <laughs> the boiling point of applesauce has to be higher than 212 degrees. Stick around for chapter 11. All right. Anyway, so I'm sorry, I was reading the chat. The, um, right, so if I want to convert between temperature scales, I always have to do two things because of the way temperature scales are generated, right? There is a difference in most cases in the size of the degree because again, I arbitrarily set my water freezing point and boiling point is zero and 100, right? Whereas in Fahrenheit, for example, the freezing point of water is 32 and the boiling point is 212, which brings us back to the chat and the applesauce. The, um, right, and so because the size of the degree is different, right, if I go up 10 degrees Celsius, that is a different number of degrees Fahrenheit. And the other thing that tends to be different in different temperature scales is where the zero is, right? And so if I want to adjust from one scale to the other, I need to recalibrate the size of a degree and move the zero, right? And so in the case of Kelvins to Celsius, turns out that one Kelvin degree is the same size as one Celsius degree. So I don't need to recalibrate the size, but I do need to move the zero. All right, zero kelvins corresponds to negative 273.15 Celsius. Or if you'd like to say it the other way around, zero Celsius is 273.15 kelvins. So you may have seen before this little conversion from kelvins to Celsius. All it's really doing is adjusting the zero. All right, if you take your degree C, Right, and add 273, you're really just moving the zero Celsius down to zero Kelvins. Right, if you go from Fahrenheit to Celsius, or frankly, Fahrenheit to Kelvins, you have to do both things because one degree Fahrenheit is not the same as one degree Celsius. If you go up one degree Fahrenheit, you only go up five ninths of a degree Celsius, 0.555, All right? And the zeros are different. Zero degrees Celsius is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so I need to recalibrate the size of the degree and shift the zero. So as you've probably seen before, one of these two or both of these conversion equations, all you're really doing right, is recalibrating the size of a degree, which is what the five ninths is doing, or if I'm going the other way, the nine fifths. And then I need to move the zero 32 degrees, one way or the other, depending on whether I'm going from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And so the minus 32, right, is moving the Fahrenheit 32 degrees down to zero degrees Celsius and recalibrating the size of the degree with the five ninths. 
And so ultimately, right, we can convert between any of those temperature scales. A lot of times we use Celsius. We hardly ever use Fahrenheit in here, although you could, right? But again, that's the English unit of temperature, which only the US really uses anymore. So a lot of times we measure things in Celsius, but if I'm quantitatively talking about energy, I am always in Kelvins. And I will point that out the times it happens. But if I'm just talking about boiling points or melting points or whatever, it really doesn't matter what I use because they are all interconvertible. Questions on any of that? Oh, it's like almost perfect timing. That never happens. Yes, no. Dr. Lansfame, someone has a question in the chat. What's the question, <laughs> Chad? They want to know if applesauce is heterogeneous or homogeneous. <laughs> um, the question from the chat is, is applesauce heterogeneous or homogeneous? I would argue if it's pulpy, it's heterogeneous. The, yes, they seem to be obsessed with applesauce in the chat. Is someone having applesauce for breakfast? What is causing this applesauce obsession? <laughs> I am going to have to read the chat later. There's a lot, whole lot of applesauce discussion going on in the chat. Um, okay, um, I will give you a free three minutes. On Monday, we will actually talk about the construction of atoms and real honest to goodness chemistry. In the meantime, go buy yourself a jar of applesauce and see if you can find apparently both the boiling point and the flash point of applesauce, which is the last two things I saw discussed. If you have questions about any of the stuff that's due or whatever, See me or email me, 